Revelation chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 9, um, because he, he's already told uh, John that there shall be time no longer. And, uh, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, he sh uh, it sh shall be the end according to his servants of prophets. I just, I misverbalized that really bad, but you get the idea of it. Anyway, now verse 8 says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So John does this. He does uh, in verse 9, uh, which is what I have up on the screen, I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And uh, he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Uh, and when I and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was it was it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples nations, tongues, and kings. Now I'm going to ask you just, uh, just to hear from you this morning and uh, just understand that there are no bad answers, okay? Except maybe the one Gary gives. But other than that, there's no wrong answer, okay? <laughs> just kidding, Gary. Um, what do you think it means when the angel, who we believe is Jesus, when he gives the book to John, John then eats the book. It tastes sweet like honey, but when it hits his stomach, it makes his belly bitter. Now, I can tell you from a diabetic standpoint uh, that when I eat things... <clears throat> like Oreo cookies. There was way too many of those left over. Yeah. So when I eat things like Oreo cookies, and I've put all that sugar in me, boy, it makes me sick. Oh, it makes me sick. And I, it doesn't really make me, uh, my stomach bitter, uh, although it kind of does. But the main thing is I feel like I have the flu. I, I ache all over. And I'm, I'm aching today, by the way, but I don't think it has anything to do with my blood sugar. Um, but I ache all over. I'm very fatigued. And all I want to do is lay down and, and kind of cover up and wait for it to pass. Because I know eventually it will. And what that is, is it's all the sugar that now is in my body. And my liver has taken all that Oreo heavenly goodness that I put in there and has instantly converted it to sugar and injected it into my bloodstream. And so I have enough blood, I have enough sugar in my blood to basically to... To run a hundred meter dash, okay? I mean, I can, I, if I could run, I could really pour it on. I would have enough energy there to do, like weightlifting or something like that. I could do that if I lifted weights, which I don't, never will. But anyway, I could do it if I wanted to. But um, at some point, because of, the, of what diabetes is and what it does, Diabetes is a condition whereby your cells have what's called insulin receptors. Those are locks that the key to, un, to unopening or to opening those locks is insulin. That's the key. You have all this sugar that's knocking on the door of your cells. In fact, in, in some cases, it's pounding on your cells. Your cells need the insulin key 
to open the door to let some of the sugar in so it could be burnt as energy. That's why I feel like I had the flu is because I, I have no energy because there's no sugar that can get inside my cells. Just can't get in there. And uh, so anyway, that's why I feel fatigued. I have no, you know, I, feel, I have no energy. I can't, I don't want to get up and do anything. Nothing. The whole thing is that key. Once that key becomes available and opens up the door, the insulin receptors open up and allow only the sugar in. Once the sugar is in, it'll close it back up and your cell will burn it for light and for energy. That's why our bodies stay warm is that our cells are burning sugar. Literally, they are burning sugar. There's a furnace in every cell that you have called the mitochondria. And it's giving in, it's the, it's the energy cell for your body and for all the cells. All right. So anyway, um, so when I have high blood sugar, I just, I can't stand it. I, I have no energy. I can't do anything. And if you suggest to me, if you get up and do something, move around a little bit, that'll reduce the sugar in your blood. That's not the problem. The problem isn't that I don't have enough sugar. The problem is that I have sugar that can't get into the cells. So it doesn't matter how much I have. It can't get in there. And that's, that's so typical of how the tabernacle worked in, in Moses' law was you had priests that would stand at the doorway to the tabernacle. And that priest was designated to examine each and every sacrifice that went into the, um, the cell or went into the tabernacle. And if the sacrifice was clean, it was, uh, if it was unspotted, uh, if it was uh, correct, and if everything was right, then the, that priest would allow whatever that was, whether it was a lamb, a goat, fine flour, oil, whatever it is, basically everything that is burnt as uh, a sacrifice in the tabernacle is something that they can eat. Imagine that. You can't gather up a bunch of rocks, bring them into God and say, God, I have these rocks. We're going to sacrifice these rocks today in your honor. I would, God would strike you dead in a heartbeat, okay? You would just be dead. You can't take anything except what can be eaten. And believe it or not, that's how the Levite priest made their living was by they were they all were allowed to receive a portion of the daily sacrifices that came in okay so anyway um when it says here that he took the book and he ate it he literally in in a literal sense he's referring to dna anything that has dna that can be eaten can go into our body and our body can convert it our liver can convert it into sugar and, um, and then our body rests for a while and then we need to eat again and so on and so on. So that's, that's the how of why um, when, the, when, the, uh, when the book went into John's belly, it tasted sweet, but it made his belly bitter. Now, why do you think the book tasted sweet i'll start there why do you think it tasted sweet to begin with it's not bad let me give you a scripture um the entrance of thy words giveth light and think about that Think about how something with DNA in it, an animal or a plant like fine flour uh, or honey or honeycomb and so on, all of those things have DNA or they came from something that had DNA. So the entrance of DNA into our body, the things we eat, it gives our body light because our body takes those things, converts them to sugars that go into our cell and our body lights them up ignites them and burnt literally burns them 
And that's how the entrance of thy words give light to us. There's another verse in Psalm 119 that says, Thy words are sweeter, are sweet to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey. Okay? And so that tells me, the first thing uh, that John is dealing with here, he's dealing with, let's say, a, a copy of the Word of God. Um, he, and in that, he's showing us how the process of of uh, burning food inside of our body gives us light and heat and so on and how that works that's all explained to us in the bible but this idea that when john took the book and he ate it initially it may it was in his mouth sweet as honey but you mentioned something that you're right about that not everything that us preachers preach about do we really want to preach about it? We don't. I've had to preach messages and look right in the eye of people that I had developed a friendship with knowing that that person was guilty of what I was preaching about. And I didn't want to do it. It made, it made me sick to my stomach. I don't like doing it. No, no good preacher. Come on in, have a seat. No good preacher worth, worth anything would enjoy preaching a bitter sermon to people that he's supposed to love. Because if he truly loves those people, he would want to avoid hurting them or hurting their feelings he would rather stab himself in the chest than to hurt the people that he loves. But he's got a job to do. Jesus had to preach right to his disciples with them knowing that he was preaching right to them. He had to preach to Judas and he knew what was going to be the outcome of it. So that's the spiritual understanding of it, the physical understanding of it is that, yeah, we all know that if we eat too much honey, what does it do? Makes you sick. I learned this when I was in Bible college. You know, you learn how to do things that you wouldn't learn to do at home because your mom would say, ah, oh, you're not doing that. It's dangerous. Some, one, of the, one of the missionary kids told me how to make pudding out of a can of sweetened condensed milk. And I happen to have, I happen to have had a, um, uh, an electric hot plate in my dorm room that they didn't know about. <laughs> and you take the unopened can, you peel the label off of it, and you put it in a pan full of boiling water. And every 15 minutes you turn that, so you have to have a pair of pliers. So you reach in there and turn that can over every 15 minutes so that it all gets cooked up real good. Once, then once it's gone through this process, usually it takes actually about an hour and a half, something like that, to get it really good and done. You turn the heat down, set the thing over. If you have a fridge, you put it in the fridge and you let it cool down until it's all cooled down. And then you open it up with a can opener. And I'm telling you, it is the sweetest, milkiest pudding that you have ever had in your life. It is awesome. I'm glad we don't have kids in here. Because they would be doing it. Uh-oh. <clears throat> Hope you uh, just ignore what I said there, Audrey. Okay, just ignore it. She didn't hear me? Awesome, good. So finally open it up, and I mean it was delicious. The thing is, I found out I had a spoon, I'd stick it in there. I could only eat like three spoons at a time. Once I got past three spoons, I'm going, whoa, that is sweet. Oh, I can't eat no more of that. So you know how smart I am. I'm a college student. So I stick the spoon in the can, stick it in the fridge. Don't cover it up or nothing. Just leave it in there. <laughs> That's what I did. Yes, sir. But anyway, eating too much sugar will make your belly bitter. Okay. I, I would never want to tell somebody to read the Bible less. I would never, ever want to say that to somebody. 
But I think that along with us reading our Bibles daily, there is also the experience of our life that when we combine it with the things that we have already read in the Scripture, the two of them, God will apply the two of them together to give us understanding and light into how that Scripture works. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, in other words, I do think that a person, uh, and I've had people that have made videos against me, and they brag about it. They say, I bet he does. I bet, I bet old Hoggard does not read the Bible near as much as I read it. I read it for 10 to 12 hours a day, every day. And I'm going, first of all, I don't believe you. Secondly, if that's all you do, I won't tell you what I thought. But anyway, that's, I, it wasn't good. Yes, Gary. There you go. Proverbs what? Oh, that I like that. Let me read that out loud here. Proverbs 16:24. Well, that was good. I want to make sure everybody hears that. Proverbs 16:24, pleasant words are as in honeycomb. And I like honeycomb too. I like the comb and the honey and everything. Sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Is that what you were reading? Yeah. It is sweet to the soul and it is health to the bones. There is a story uh, in, in the days when Saul was king over Israel and they were pursuing their enemies. And Saul said to everybody, not, not just the army guys that, that he had in his, in his militia, but he said it to all the fighting men of Israel. He said, we're going to pursue this, this enemy, this enemy's army, we're going to pursue them until the very last one is dead. And I don't want to see anybody stopping to get a drink of water. I don't want to see anybody sitting down and having a little picnic snack. I don't want to see any of it until those people are all dead. Well, that was dumb to do. As a leader, you just, you just ruined your army is what you did. You have to let those guys pause for a while, take a break, sit down. Smoke them if you got them, I guess, or whatever. But eat something and get something in your body so that you can refresh yourself and get up and go chase the guy that you're chasing. Well, Saul's son, Jonathan, did not hear what his dad said. And so he doesn't know what his father said. So he's got a servant with him. They're looking for those enemies. Well, Jonathan sees some honeycomb hanging off of a tree and it's just dripping down on the ground and the bible says that saul and i like how the bible words this the bible says that uh jonathan saul's son took his rod dipped it in the honeycomb put it to his lips and the bible says and it lightened his eyes what happened physically he got a rush of sugar that his body was desperately looking for it needed that sugar blast is what it did uh, when they make meals ready to eat for the for the military those things are some of the most unhealthy meals you could get they are what about five thousand six thousand calories per meal and i mean calorie after calorie sweet things all kinds of breads and everything for you to stuff in your belly because that may be the only meal you get that day and your body's going to need those carbs for the rest of the day, those carbs and that sugar. So all of this, all of this, I love it, it all applies there. But the idea of the bitterness, in fact, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2, turn there. In Ezekiel's story, it's a little different. Um, God does almost the exact same thing with Ezekiel, uh, but it doesn't tell us that it made Ezekiel sick. It doesn't tell us that. Ezekiel chapter 2, and verse 6, And thou, son of man, he says to them, Be not afraid of them, neither be fr afraid of their words. Think about that. Um, the thing that I think puts the most fear into me is 
Not necessarily what people do, but what people say. And I've always been that way. Um, but anyway, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. Briars and thorns are, are types of, of sin and what sin does. And let me just say this to everybody. At some point, God may call several of you uh, over the span of time to serve in, in some aspect of this church. Um, you may, God may call on you to be a deacon. God may call on you to be um, one, of the, uh, one of the church trustees. God may call on you to be like an assistant pastor or assistant preacher so that in the times that I'm gone, we, we actually have someone to stand in my place and, and preach to the congregation. And one of the things that the devil's going to hit you with is, well, you're not worthy to do this. Why did you even accept this? You're not even close to being worthy of God calling you. Listen, my friend, if God has saved you, don't deny it. Don't deny it. You know what the Bible says about you? That if God calls you, number one, if God calls you to salvation, that's the main thing right there. But number two, if God calls you into some office of some kind, some ministry of some kind, the Bible says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Meaning that if God called you into something, he's never ever going to be sorry that he did it. He wouldn't have called you if he was going to be sorry later down the road because he would know it. And if, and if God didn't think that the things that you might end up doing in the course of the years that are to come, God sees it all. If God would have known uh, how bad you're, gonna, you're just going to blow it one day, if God, if God would have known that ahead of time, God would have never called you to that office. But I don't believe that. I think the Bible teaches us clearly that God will call people and those, he, and there's a phrase and it goes like this, God does not call those who are qualified. He qualifies those who are called. And I absolutely believe in that. Uh, when God called me, I was not qualified. But later on, God over the years has qualified me, okay? So he says, thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and though, and though thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And he's talking about the people of Israel, his own people. And he said, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. So in verse 9, Ezekiel says, When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, uh, uh, me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein, lamentations and mourning and woe didn't sound like anything like a Joel Osteen sermon did it no far from it actually God was going to require Ezekiel to tell it like it really is don't sugarcoat it don't sweeten it up don't water it down don't change it so that you don't hurt somebody's feelings. God, the one night many years ago, in fact, it was around the year 2000, God had me listen to a message. I was at a Bible camp meeting, and I'm getting mad at this preacher, and my wife just is eating it up. And I'm sitting here just mad, mad, mad. And uh, I turned around and looked at her and I said, 
I don't, I don't believe you ought to preach like that. She elbowed me and she said, how come you're not preaching like that? Boy, I got mad that night. Oh, I got, that stung me like a wasp. That stung me like a hornet. But she was right. Whether it hurt somebody's feelings or not, if I did it in love, and did it with the qualifications of love, I had an obligation to tell those people what God said. Whether it makes you mad or not. Chances are, chances are, that somebody here right now will not be here five years, ten years from now, and it will be because of me. They will, they will say, it's because of that pastor. Uh, he made me mad. I think he's gone off the deep end. He's, he said things that we do, and we don't see anything wrong with them. And it's always going to be the pastor. That's how we think. Somebody leaves, it's always going to be the pastor. And... Um, I hate that, but that's the job. So Ezekiel gets the job of he's got to preach this and he's given the book and it was sweet as honey, but there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Now, look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he calls me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I have given thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth sweet as honey or uh, as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. Now, let me stop here and explain what's going on theologically. I keep putting it and I can't find it. Here's what's happening theologically. This is the method of God transmitting his word to mortal men. People say the doubt casters, the unbelievers, they say the Bible was written by men or the Bible was written by church elders and they wrote it in such a way as to give them authority and to give them, uh, make, make them the boss and Lord of everybody's life. And that's why I don't read no Bible. But I believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, how did you end up believing in them if you don't believe the Bible? But they will say, I don't believe the Bible. I think it was written by men. There might be some good things in here. But by and large, it's an evil book because it was written by the hands of man. Yes, but God took his very words and he laid them out before Ezekiel. And he said, Ezekiel, eat these words. And Ezekiel ate them. He ate the book. John, same thing. John took the book and ate it. Gobbled it up in his mouth, sweet as honey. That's how we know it's the word of God. And in both cases, God now says, from now to this point forward, you're going to preach everything that you have taken in to yourself. You're going to preach those things. A word to those who maybe, maybe God is working a message in you. And you think that God is uh, maybe leading you to, to preach that message here at an opportunity when I'm going to be gone or out of town on a Sunday. And um, so you, you've studied up, you've read the Bible, you've got it in you. And so when it comes time for you to preach, it doesn't matter how nervous you might get. If God's in it, his word is going to come out of your mouth. And it's just like that young man that I had here. Did y'all see him? What did he do? He sat there and he read scriptures to you. Read scriptures. What better thing can a young man his age do? To preach to adults. Those whom he has to be under their authority. They're his leaders. He has to look up to them. He has to... Uh, admire them. He has to respect them. How does then, uh, uh, how old was he? 11 year old boy. How does he preach to adults? He reads that Bible. 
and he reads that Bible to those people. And if you don't like it, too bad. It was the Word of God. And it's that simple. It is that simple. And so to any preacher who might be listening to this Sunday school lesson, I want to encourage you, if you haven't eaten the Word of God, you cannot give out what you have not partaken of. Amen? I got, I used to get stuff in the mail. We're going to close. I used to get stuff in the mail for years. There was advertisements, these little three by five cards. And they would send me a whole packet of them. And I, and I used to like them because some of that stuff looked pretty cool. But there was always a company that wanted to sell me three months worth of sermons. You'd get a Sunday morning sermon, Sunday night sermon, Wednesday night sermon. You'd get an extra teaching in there for like Sunday school or whatever that you could put in anywhere. And it had all the verses laid out. It had all the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the words or the, what am I trying to think of? Um, you start with A and then go to B and then go to C. Outline. Thank you. That was hard for me. They got it all outlined out so that preacher can spend his week playing golf, spend his week playing video games, spend his week doing things on the internet he should not be doing. But because he can get up and he can preach that sermon that was sent to him, he can do so without any conviction whatsoever. He can do that to everybody. And everybody thinks, oh, our pastor, he's a good pastor. Boy, he preaches good sermons. He bought and paid for them. They were written by some professional. And they were sold to him. He bought and paid for them. He hasn't been in his Bible at all. And I know, I know for a fact, I know a guy that I went to Bible college with that did that. I know it for a fact. And I, I knew the guy and I knew what he did. I caught him at it. And uh, what a shame because there's nothing better than for me to spend time in this book seeking out God's plan and God's ideas, God's messages. Nothing better that I can do. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this word. We thank you, Lord, for it. Pray, Father, that you would guide us with it. Show us, Lord, the things that are coming down the road. And, Lord, there is an application in every part of our life for the things that we have both read, the things that we have seen from your word. And I pray, dear God, that in due season and in due time, Lord, you would show us the application. You would show us the picture. You would show us, dear God, what it means to us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there is somebody that we come across that needs this particular message, Father, that we would be ready to give an answer to them that call upon you and call upon the name of the Lord because they want answers from the Word of God. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would make us soul winners for you. Bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen, 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 amen.